This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Peterson, Massa Martana, Italy. Vanity Fair by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter 66. Amentium Are. Frankness and kindness, like Amelia's, were likely to touch even such a hardened little reprobate as Becky. She returned to Emmy's caresses and kind speeches with something very like gratitude, an emotion which, if it was not lasting, for a moment was almost genuine. That was a lucky stroke of hers about the child, torn from her arm shrieking. It was by that harrowing misfortune that Becky had won her friend back, and it was one of the very first points, we may be certain, upon which our poor, simple little Emmy began to talk to her new-found acquaintance. "'And so they took your darling child from you?' our simpleton cried out. "'Oh, Rebecca, my dear, poor, suffering friend, I know what it is to lose a boy, and to feel for those who have lost one. But please, heaven yours will be restored to you, as a merciful, merciful providence has brought me back mine. "'The child, my child, oh, yes, my agonies were frightful,' Becky owned, not perhaps without a twinge of conscience.' It jarred upon her to be obliged to commence instantly to tell lies in reply to so much confidence and simplicity. But that is the misfortune of beginning with this kind of forgery. When one fib becomes due, as it were, you must forge another to take up the old acceptance, and so the stock of your lies in circulation inevitably multiplies, and the danger of detection increases every day. "'My agonies,' Becky continued, "'were terrible. "'I hope she won't sit down on the bottle. "'When they took him away from me, "'I thought I should die. "'But I fortunately had a brain fever, "'during which my doctor gave me up, "'and, and I recovered, and, and here I am, "'poor and friendless.' "'How old is he?' Emmy asked. Eleven, said Becky. Eleven, cried the other. "'Why, he was born the same year Georgie, who is—' "'I know, I know,' Becky cried out, "'who had, in fact, quite forgotten all about little Rawdon's age. "'Grief has made me forget so many things, dearest Amelia. "'I am very much changed, half wild sometimes.' He was eleven when they took him away from me. Bless his sweet face. I have never seen it again. Was he fair or dark, went on that absurd little Emmy. Show me his hair. Becky almost laughed at her simplicity. Not today, love. Some other time, when my trunks arrived from Leipzig, once I came to this place, and a little drawing of him, which I made in happy days. "'Poor, poor Becky, poor Becky,' said Emmy. "'How thankful, how thankful I ought to be, "'though I doubt whether that practice of piety "'inculcated upon us by our womankind in early youth, "'namely, to be thankful because we are better off than someone else, "'be a very rational religious exercise.' "'And then she began to think, as usual, "'how her son was the handsomest, the best, and the cleverest boy in the whole world. "'You will see my Georgie,' was the best thing Emmy could think of to console Becky. "'If anything could make her comfortable, that would.' "'And so the two women continued talking for an hour or more, "'during which Becky had the opportunity of giving her new friend "'a full and complete version of her private history.' She showed her how marriage with Rawdon Crowley had always been viewed by the family with feelings of the utmost hostility, how her sister-in-law, an artful woman, had poisoned her husband's mind against her, how he had formed odious connections, which had estranged his affections from her, how she had borne everything—poverty, neglect, coldness from the being whom she loved most— and all for the sake of her child. 
how finally and by the most flagrant outrage she had been driven into demanding a separation from her husband when the wretch did not scruple to ask that she should sacrifice her own fair fame so that he might procure advancement through the means of a very great and powerful but unprincipled man the marquis of stein indeed that atrocious monster this part of her eventful history becky gave with the utmost feminine delicacy and the most indignant virtue forced to fly her husband's roof by this insult the coward had pursued his revenge by taking her child from her and thus becky said she was a wanderer poor unprotected friendless and wretched Emmy received this story, which was told at some length, as those persons who are acquainted with her character may imagine that she would. She quivered with indignation at the account of the conduct of the miserable Rawdon and the unprincipled Stein. Her eyes made notes of admiration for every one of the sentences in which Becky described the persecutions of her aristocratic relatives and the falling away of her husband. Becky did not abuse him. She spoke rather in sorrow than in anger. She had loved him only too fondly, and was he not the father of her boy? And as for the separation seen from the child, while Becky was reciting it, Emmy retired altogether behind her pocket handkerchief, so that the consummate little tragedian must have had been charmed to see the effect which her performance produced on her audience. Whilst the ladies were carrying on in their conversation, Amelia's constant escort, the Major, who of course did not wish to interrupt their conference, and found himself rather tired of creaking about the narrow stair passage of which the roof brushed the nap from his hair, descended to the ground floor of the house and into the great room common to all the frequenters of the elephant out of which the stair led. This apartment is always in a fume of smoke, and liberally sprinkled with beer. On a dirty table stand scores of corresponding brass candlesticks with tallow candles for the lodgers, whose keys hang up in rows over the candles. Emmy had passed blushing through the room anon, where all sorts of people were collected. Tyrolese glove sellers and Nubian linen merchants, with their packs, students recruiting themselves with butter broads and meat, idlers playing at cards or dominoes on the sloppy, beery tables, tumblers refreshing during the cessation of their performances. In a word, all the fumum and stripitis of a German inn at fair time. The waiter brought the major a mug of beer, as a matter of course, and he took out a cigar and amused himself with that pernicious vegetable and a newspaper until his charge should come down to claim him. Max and Fritz came presently downstairs, their caps on one side, their spurs jingling, their pipes splendid with coats of arms and full-blown tassels, and they hung up the key of number 90 on the board and called for the ration of butterbrod and beer. The pair sat down by the major, and fell into a conversation of which he could not help hearing somewhat. It was mainly about fuchs and philaster, and duels and drinking bouts at the neighboring university of Skappenhausen, from which renowned seat of learning they had just come in the Eilwagen, with Becky, as it appeared, by their side, and in order to be present at the bridal feats at Pumpernickel. The title England Derrin always seem un base de geno science, said Max, who knew the French language to Fritch, his comrade. After the frat grandfather went away, there came a pretty little compatriot. I heard them chattering and whimping together in the little woman's chamber. We must take seats for her concert, Fritz said. Hast thou any money, Max? Pa, said the other. The concert is a concert in Nubibus. Han said that she advertised one at Leipzig, and Burschen took many tickets, but she went off without singing. She said in the coach yesterday that her pianist had fallen ill at Dresden. She cannot sing, it is my belief. Her voice is as cracked as thine, O oh beer-soaking renowner. 
It is cracked. I hear trying out of the window a shrecklick English ballad called De Rose upon de Balgane. Salfin and singin go not together, observed Fritz with a red nose, who evidently preferred the former amusement. No, thou shalt take none of her tickets. She won money at the Trente and Quarente last night. I saw her. She made a little English boy play for her. We will spend thy money there or at the theatre, or we will treat her to French wine and cognac in Aurelius' garden. But the tickets we will not buy. What sayest thou, yet another mug of beer? And one and another successively, having buried their blond whiskers in the mawkish drought, curled them and swaggered off into the fair. The maider who had seen the key of number ninety put upon its hooks and heard the conversation of the two young university bloods was not at a loss to understand that their talk related to Becky. The little devil is at her old tricks, he thought, and he smiled as he recalled old days when he had witnessed the desperate flirtation with Joss and the ludicrous end of that adventure. He and George had often laughed over it subsequently, and until a few weeks after George's marriage, when he also was caught in the little Circe's toils, he had an understanding with her which his comrade certainly suspected, but preferred to ignore. William was too much hurt, or ashamed, to ask to fathom that disgraceful mystery, although once, and evidently with remorse on his mind, George had alluded to it. It was on the morning of Waterloo, as the young men stood together in front of their line, surveying the black masses of Frenchmen who crowned the opposite heights, and as the rain was coming down. I have been mixing in a foolish intrigue with a woman, George said. I am glad we were marched away. If I drop, I hope Emmy will never know of that business. I wish to God it had never been begun. And William was pleased to think. And had more than once soothed poor George's widow with a narrative that Osborne, after quitting his wife, and after the action of Quate Bras on the first day, spoke gravely and affectionately to his comrade of his father and his wife. On these facts, too, William had insisted very strongly in his conversations with the elder Osborne. And had thus been the means of reconciling the old gentleman to his son's memory, just at the close of the elder man's life. And so this devil is still going on with her intrigues, thought William. I wish she were a hundred miles away from here. She brings mischief wherever she goes. And as he was pursuing these forebodings and this uncomfortable train of thought, With his head between his hands and the pumpernickel gazette of last week unread under his nose, when somebody tapped his shoulder with a parasol, and he looked up and saw Mrs. Amelia. This woman had a way of tyrannizing over Major Dobbin, for the weakest of all people will domineer over somebody, and she ordered him about and patted him and made him fetch and carry just as if he were a great Newfoundland dog. He liked, so to speak, to jump into the water if she said, Hi, Dobbin! and to trot behind her with her reticule in his mouth. This history has been written to very little purpose if the reader has not perceived that the major was a spoony. Why did not you not wait for me, sir, to escort me downstairs? she said, giving a little toss of her head and a most sarcastic curtsy. I couldn't stand up in the passage, he answered with comical, deprecatory look, and, delighted to give her his arm and to take her out of the horrid, smoky place, he would have walked out without even so much as remembering the waiter had not the young fellow run after him and stopped him on the threshold of the elephant to make him pay for the beer which he had not consumed. Emmy laughed. She called him a naughty man who wanted to run away in debt. And in fact made some jokes suitable to the occasion and the small beer. She was in high spirits and good humor, and tripped across the market place very briskly. She wanted to see Joss that instant. The Major laughed at the impetuous affection Mrs. Amelia exhibited, 
for in truth it was not very often that she wanted her brother that instant. They found the civilian in his saloon on the first floor. He had been pacing the room and biting his nails and looking over the market place towards the elephant a hundred times at least during the past hour, whilst Emmy was closeted with her friend in the garret and the major was beating the tattoo on the sloppy tables of the public room below, and he was, on his side too, very anxious to see Mrs. Osborne. Well, said he. The poor dear creature, how she has suffered, Emmy said. God bless my soul, yes, Joss said, wagging his head, so that his cheeks quivered like jellies. She may have Payne's room, who can go upstairs, Emmy continued. Payne was a staid English maid and personal attendant upon Mrs. Osborne, to whom the courier, as in duty bound, paid court, and whom Georgie used to lark dreadfully with accounts of German robbers and ghosts. She passed her time chiefly in grumbling, in ordering about her mistress, and in stating her intention to return the next morning to her native village of Clapham. She may have Payne's room, Emmy said. "'Why, you don't mean to say that you're going to have that woman into the house?' bounced out the Major, jumping up. "'Of course we are,' said Amelia, in the most innocent way in the world. "'Don't be angry and break the furniture, Major Dobbin. Of course we are going to have her here.' "'Of course, my dear,' Joss said. "'The poor creature, after all her sufferings,' Emmy continued." Her horrid banker broken and run away, her husband, wicked wretch, having deserted her and taken her child away from her. Here she doubled her two little fists and held them in a most menacing attitude before her, so that the major was charmed to see such a dauntless virago. The poor dear thing, quite alone and absolutely forced to give lessons and singing to get her bread, and not have her here? "'Take lessons, my dear Mrs. George,' cried the Major. "'But don't have her in the house. I implore you, don't.' "'Pooh!' said Joss. "'You, who are always good and kind, always used to be at any rate. "'I'm astonished at you, Major William,' Amelia cried. "'Why, what is the moment to help her but when she is so miserable? "'Now is the time to be of service to her.' "'The oldest friend I ever had, and not—' "'She was not always your friend, Amelia,' the Major said, for he was quite angry. "'This allusion was too much for Emmy, who, looking the Major almost fiercely in the face, said, "'For shame, Major Dobbin!' "'And after having fired this shot, she walked out of the room with a most majestic air, "'and shut her own door briskly on herself and her outraged dignity.' "'To allude to that,' she said when the door was closed. "'Oh, it was cruel of him to remind me of it!' And she looked up at George's picture, which hung there as usual, with a portrait of the boy underneath. "'It was cruel of him. If I had forgiven it, ought he to have spoken? No, and it is from his own lips that I know how wicked and groundless my jealousy was, and that you were pure. Oh, yes!' "'You were pure, my saint in heaven.' She paced the room, trembling and indignant. She went and leaned on the chest of drawers over which the picture hung, and gazed and gazed at it. Its eyes seemed to look down on her with a reproach that deepened as she looked. The early dear, dear memories of that brief prime of love rushed back upon her. The wound which years had scarcely cicatrized bled afresh, and, oh, how bitterly! She could not bear the reproaches of the husband there before her. It couldn't be. Never, never. Poor Dobbin! Poor old William! That unlucky word had undone the work of many a year, the long, laborious edifice of a life of love and constancy, raised too upon what secret and hidden foundations wherein lay buried passions uncounted struggles unknown sacrifices 
a little word was spoken, and down fell the fair palace of hope. One word, and away flew the bird which he had been trying all his life to lure. William, though he saw by Amelia's looks that a great crisis had come, nevertheless continued to implore Sedley, in the most energetic terms, to beware of Rebecca. And he eagerly, almost frantically, adjured Joss not to receive her. He besought Mr. Sedley to inquire, at least regarding her, told him how he had heard that she was in the company of gamblers and people of ill repute, pointed out what evil she had done in her former days, how she and Crawley had misled poor George into ruin, how she was now parted from her husband by her own confession, and perhaps for good reason. What a dangerous companion she would be for his sister, who knew nothing of the affairs of the world. William implored Joss, with all the eloquence which he could bring to bear, and a great deal more energy than this quiet gentleman was ordinarily in the habit of showing, to keep Rebecca out of his household. Had he been less violent, or more dexterous, he might have succeeded in his supplications to Joss, but the civilian was not a little jealous of the airs of superiority which the Major constantly exhibited towards him, as he fancied. Indeed, he had imparted his opinions to Mr. Kirsch, the courier, whose bills Major Dobbin checked on this journey, and who sided with his master and he began a blustering speech about his competency to defend his own honor, his desire not to have his affairs meddled with, his intention, in fine, to rebel against the major, when the colloquy, rather a long and stormy one, was put an end to in the simplest way possible, namely, by the arrival of Mrs. Becky, with a porter from the Elephant Hotel, in charge of her very meager baggage. She greeted her host with affectionate respect, and made a shrinking but amicable salutation to Major Dobbin, who, as her instinct assured her at once, was her enemy, and had been speaking against her. And the bustle and clatter consequent upon her arrival brought Amelia out of her room. Emmy went up and embraced her guest with the greatest warmth, and took no notice of the Major, except to fling him an angry look the most unjust and scornful glance that had perhaps ever appeared in that poor little woman's face since she was born. But she had private reasons of her own, as when was bent at being angry with him, and when Dobbin, indignant at the injustice, not at the defeat, went off, making her a bow quite as haughty as the killing curtsy with which the little woman chose to bid him farewell. He being gone, Emmy was particularly lively and affectionate to Rebecca, and bustled about the apartments and installed her guest in her room with an eagerness and activity seldom exhibited by our placid little friend. But when an act of injustice is to be done, especially by weak people, it is best that it should be done quickly, and Emmy thought she was displaying a great deal of firmness and proper feeling and veneration for the late Captain Osborne in her present behavior. Georgie came in from the fetes for dinner-time, and found four covers laid as usual, but one of the places was occupied by a lady instead of by Major Dobbin. "'Hullo! Where's Dobb?' the young gentleman asked, with his usual simplicity of language. "'Major Dobbin is dining out, I suppose,' his mother said, and drawing the boy to her, kissed him a great deal, and put his hair off his forehead, and introduced him to Mrs. Crawley. "'This is my boy, Rebecca,' Miss Asa Osborne said, as much as to say, "'Can the world produce anything like that?' Becky looked at him with rapture, and pressed his hand fondly. "'Dear boy,' she said, "'he is just like my—' Emotion choked her further utterance, but Amelia understood, as well as if she had spoken, that Becky was thinking of her own blessed child. However, the company of her friend consoled Mrs. Crawley, and she ate a very good dinner. 
During the repast she had occasion to speak several times, when Georgie eyed her and listened to her. At the dessert Emmy was gone out to superintend further domestic arrangements. Jos was in his great chair dozing over Galignani. Georgie and the new arrival sat close to each other. He had continued to look at her knowingly more than once, and at last he laid down the nutcrackers. "'I say,' said Georgie. "'What do you say?' Becky said, laughing. "'You're the lady I saw in the mask at the Rouge at Noir.' "'Hush, you sly little creature,' Becky said, taking up his hand and kissing it. "'Your uncle was there, too, and Mamma mustn't know.' "'Oh, no, not by no means,' answered the little fellow. "'You see, we are quite good friends already.' Becky said to Emmy, who now re-entered, and it must be owned that Mrs. Osborne had introduced a most judicious and amiable companion into her house. William, in a state of great indignation, though still unaware of all the treason that was in store for him, walked about the town wildly until he fell upon the secretary of legation, Tapeworm, who invited him to dinner. As they were discussing that meal, he took occasion to ask the secretary whether he knew anything about a certain Mrs. Rodden Crawley, who had, he believed, made some noise in London. And then Tapeworm, who of course knew all the London gossip, was besides a relative of Lady Gaunt, poured out into the astonished Major's ears such a history about Becky and her husband as astonished the querist, and supplied all the points of this narrative, for it was at that very table years ago that the present writer had the pleasure of hearing the tale. Tufto, Stein, the Crawleys, and their history, everything connected with Becky and her previous life passed under the record of the bitter diplomatist. He knew everything, and a great deal besides, about all the world. In a word, he made the most astounding revelations to the simple-hearted Major. When Dobbin said that Mrs. Osborne and Mr. Sedley had taken her into their house, Tapeworm burst into a peal of laughter which shocked the Major, and asked if they had not better send into the prison and take in one or two of the gentlemen in shaved heads and yellow jackets who swept the streets of Pumpernickel, chained in pairs, to board and lodge and act as tutor to that little scapegrace Georgie. This information astonished and horrified the Major not a little. It had been agreed in the morning, before meeting with Rebecca, that Amelia should go to the court ball that night. There would be the place where he should tell her. The Major went home and dressed himself in his uniform, and repaired to court, in hopes to see Mrs. Osborne. She never came. When he returned to his lodgings, all the lights in the Sedley tenement were put out. He could not see her till the morning. I don't know what sort of a night's rest he had with this frightful secret in bed with him. At the earliest convenient hour in the morning he sent his servant across the way with a note, saying that he wished very particularly to speak with her. A message came back to say that Mrs. Osborne was exceedingly unwell and was keeping her room. She, too, had been awake all that night. She had been thinking of a thing which had agitated her mind a hundred times before. A hundred times on the point of yielding she had shrunk back from a sacrifice which she felt was too much for her. She couldn't, in spite of his love and constancy, and her own acknowledged regard, respect, and gratitude. What are benefits, and what is constancy or merit? One curl of a girl's ringlet, one hair of a whisker, will turn the scale against them all in a minute. They did not weigh with Emmy more than with other women. She had tried them wanted to make them pass, could not, and the pitiless little woman had found a pretext, and determined to be free. When at length, in the afternoon, the Major gained admission to Amelia, instead of the cordial and affectionate greeting to which he had become accustomed now for many a long day, he received the salutation of a curtsey, and of a little gloved hand, retracted the moment after it was accorded to him. 
Rebecca, too, was in the room, and advanced to meet him with a smile and an extended hand. Dobbin drew back rather confusedly. I, I beg your pardon, ma'am, he said, but I am bound to tell you that it is not as your friend I am come here now. Pooh! Damn! Don't let us have this sort of thing, Jess cried out, alarmed and anxious to get rid of his scene. I wonder what Major Dobbin has to say against Rebecca, Amelia said in a low, clear voice with a slight quiver in it and a very determined look about the eyes. I will not have this sort of thing in my house, Jess again interposed. I say I will not have it, and Dobbin, I beg you, sir, you'll stop it. And he looked around, trembling and turning very red, and gave a great puff and made for the door. Dear friend, Rebecca said with angelic sweetness, do hear what Major Dobbin has to say against me. I will not hear it, I say, squeaked out Joss at the top of his voice, and gathering up his dressing gown, he was gone. We are only two women, Amelia said. You can speak now, sir. This manner towards me is one which scarcely becomes you, Amelia, the Major answered haughtily. Nor, I believe, am I guilty of habitual harshness to women. It is not a pleasure to me to do the duty which I am come to do. Pray proceed with it quickly, if you please, Major Dobbin, said Amelia, who is more and more in a pet. The expression of Dobbin's face, as she spoke in this imperious manner, was not pleasant. I came to say, and as you stay, Mrs. Crawley, I must say it in your presence, that I think you, you ought not to form a member of the family of my friends. A lady who is separated from her husband, who travels not under her own name, who frequents public gaming tables. <laughs> it was to the ball I went, cried out Becky. Is not a fit companion for Mrs. Osborne and her son, Dobbin went on, and I may add that there are people here who know you, and who profess to know that regarding your conduct, about which I don't even wish to speak before, before Mrs. Osborne. Yours is a very modest and convenient sort of calumny, Major Dobbin, Rebecca said. You leave me under the weight of an accusation which, after all, is unsaid. What is it? Is it unfaithfulness to my husband? I scorn it and defy anybody to prove it. I defy you, I say. My honor is untouched as that of the bitterest enemy who ever maligned me. Is it of being poor, forsaken, wretched that you accuse me? Yes, I am guilty of those faults, and punished for them every day. Let me go, Emmy. It is only to suppose that I have not met you, and I am no worse today than I was yesterday. It is only to suppose that the night is over and the poor wanderer is on her way. Don't you remember the song we used to sing in old, dear old days? I have been wandering ever since then, a poor castaway, scorned for being miserable, and insulted because I am alone. Let me go. My stay here interferes with the plans of this gentleman. Indeed it does, madam, said the Major. If I have any authority in this house. Authority? None! broke out Amelia. Rebecca, you stay with me. I won't desert you because you have been persecuted, or insult you because, because Major Dobbin chooses to do so. Come away, my dear. And the two women made towards the door. William opened it. As they were going out, however, he took Amelia's hand and said, Will you stay a moment and speak to me? He wishes to speak to you away from me, said Becky, looking like a martyr. Amelia gripped her hand in reply. Upon my honor, it is not about you that I am going to speak, Dobbin said. Come back, Amelia. And she came. Dobbin bowed to Mrs. Crawley as he shut the door upon her. Amelia looked at him, leaning against the glass. Her face and her lips were quite white. I was confused when I spoke just now, the Major said after a pause. 
and I misused the word authority. You did, said Amelia, with her teeth chattering. At least I have claims to be heard, Dobbin continued. It is generous to remind me of our obligations to you, the woman answered. The claims I mean are those left to me by George's father, William said. Yes, and you insulted his memory. You did yesterday. You know you did. And I will never forgive you. Never! said Amelia. She shot out each little sentence in a tremor of anger and emotion. You don't mean that, Amelia, William said sadly. You don't mean those words uttered in a hurried moment are to weigh against the whole life's devotion? I think that George's memory has not been injured by the way in which I have dealt with it, and if we are come to bandying reproaches, I at least merit none from his widow and the mother of his son. Reflect afterwards when, when you were at your leisure, and your conscience will withdraw this accusation. It does even now. Amelia held down her head. It is not that speech of yesterday, he continued, which moves you. That is but the pretext, Amelia. Or I have loved you and watched you for fifteen years in vain. Have I not learned in that time to read all your feelings and to look into your thoughts? I know what your heart is capable of. It can cling faithfully to a recollection and cherish a fancy. But it can't feel such an attachment as mine deserves to mate with, and such as I would have won from a woman more generous than you. No, you are not worthy of the love which I have devoted to you. I knew all along that the prize I had set my life on was not worth the winning, that I was a fool with fond fancies too, bartering away all of truth and ardor against your little feeble remnant of love. I will bargain no more. I withdraw. I find no fault with you. You are very good natured and have done your best, but you couldn't. You couldn't reach up to the height of the attachment which I bore you, and which a loftier soul than yours might have been proud to share. Good bye, Amelia. I have watched your struggle. Let it end. We are both weary of it. Amelia stood scared and silent as William thus suddenly broke the chain by which she had held him and declared his independence and superiority. He had placed himself at her feet so long that the poor little woman had been accustomed to trample upon him. She didn't wish to marry him, but she wished to keep him. She wished to give him nothing, but that he should give her all. It is a bargain not unfrequently levied in love. William Sally had quite broken and cast her down. Her assault was long since over and beaten back. Am I to understand, then, that you are going away, William? she said. He gave a sad laugh. I went once before, he said, and came back after twelve years. We were young then, Amelia. Goodbye. I have spent enough of my life at this play. Whilst they had been talking, the door into Mrs. Osborne's room had opened ever so little. Indeed, Becky had kept a hold of the handle, and had turned it on the instant when Dobbin quitted it, and she heard every word of the conversation that had passed between these two. What a noble heart that man has, she thought, and how shamefully that woman plays with it. She admired Dobbin. She bore him no rancor for the part he had taken against her. It was an open move in the game, and played fairly. Ah, she thought, if I could have had such a husband as that, a man with a heart and brains too, I would not have minded his large feet. And running into the room, she absolutely bethought herself of something, and wrote him a note, beseeching him to stop for a few days, not to think of going, and with that she could serve him with A. The parting was over. Once more poor William walked to the door and was gone, and the little widow, the author of all this work, had her will, and had won her victory, 
and was left to enjoy it as best she might. Let the ladies envy her triumph. At the romantic hour of dinner, Mr. Georgie made his appearance and again remarked the absence of old Dobb. The meal was eaten in silence by the party, Joss's appetite not being diminished, but Emmy taking nothing at all. After the meal, Georgie was lolling in the cushions of the old window, a large window, with three sides of glass abutting from the gable, and commanding on one side the market place, where the elephant is, his mother being busy hard by, when he remarked symptoms of movement at the major's house on the other side of the street. Hello, said he, there's Dobbs' trap. They are bringing it out of the courtyard. The trap in question was a carriage which the major had bought for six pounds sterling, and about which they used to rally him a good deal. Emmy gave a little start, but said nothing. Hello, Georgie continued. There's Francis coming out with a portmanteaus, and Cunz, the one-eyed postillion, coming down the market with three shimmels. Look at his boots and yellow jacket. Ain't he a rum one? Why, they're putting the horses to Dobbs' carriage. Is he going anywhere? Yes, said Emmy. He is going on a journey. Going on a journey? And when is he coming back? He is not coming back answered Emmy. "'Not coming back!' cried out Georgie, jumping up. "'Stay here, sir!' roared out Josh. "'Stay, Georgie!' said his mother with a very sad face. The boy stopped, kicked about the room, jumped up and down from the window seat with his knees, and showed every symptom of uneasiness and curiosity. The horses were put to. The baggage was strapped on. Francis came out with his master's sword, cane, and umbrella tied up together, and laid them in the well, and his desk and old tin cocked hat case, which he placed under the seat. Francis brought out the stand old blue coat lined with red camlet, which he had wrapped the owner up any time these fifteen years, and had mansion stern herblet, as a favorite song of those days said. It had been new for the campaign of Waterloo, and had covered George and William after the night of Quatre Bras. Old Burke, the landlord of the lodgings, came out, then Francis, with more packages, final packages, then Major William. Burke wanted to kiss him. The Major was adored by all people with whom he had to do. It was with difficulty he could escape from this demonstration of attachment. "'By Jove, I will go!' screamed out George. "'Give him this,' said Becky, quite interested, and put a paper into the boy's hand. He had rushed down the stairs and flung across the street in a minute. The yellow postillion was cracking his whip gently. William had got into the carriage, released from the embraces of his landlord. George bounded in afterwards and flung his arms round the Major's neck as they saw from the window, and began asking him multiplied questions. Then he felt in his waistcoat pocket and gave him a note. William seized at it rather eagerly. He opened it trembling, but instantly his countenance changed, and he tore the paper in two and dropped it out of the carriage. He kissed Georgie on the head, and the boy got out, doubling his fists into his eyes, and with the aid of Francis. He lingered with his hand on the panel. Fort, Schwager! The yellow postillion cracked his whip prodigiously, up sprang Francis to the box, away went the shimmels, and Dobbin with his head on his breast. He never looked up as they passed under Amelia's window, and Georgie, left alone in the street, burst out crying in the face of all the crowd. Emmy's maid heard him howling again during the night, and brought him some preserved apricots to console him. She mingled her lamentations with his. All the poor, all the humble, all honest folks, all good men who knew him, loved that kind-hearted and gen simple gentleman. As for Emmy, had she not done her duty? She had her picture of George for consolation. End of chapter 66
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Vanity Fair, William Makepeace Thackeray, Chapter 67 which contains births, marriages, and deaths. Whatever Becky's private plan might be by which Dobbin's true love was to be crowned with success, the little woman thought that the secret might keep, and indeed, being by no means so much interested about anybody's welfare as her own, she had a great number of things pertaining to herself, to consider, and which concerned her a great deal more than Major Dobbin's happiness in this life. She found herself suddenly and unexpectedly in snug, comfortable quarters, surrounded by friends, kindness, and good-natured, simple people, such as she had not met with for many a long day, and wanderer as she was, by force and inclination, there were moments when rest was pleasant to her, as the most hardened Arab that ever careered across the desert over the hump of a dromedary likes to repose sometimes under the date trees by the water, or to come into the cities, walk in the bazaars, refresh himself in the baths, and say his prayers in the mosque, before he goes out again marauding. Joe's tents and pilav were pleasant to this little Ishmaelite. She picketed her steed, hung up her weapons, and warmed herself comfortably by his fire. The halt in that roving, restless life was inexpressibly soothing and pleasant to her. So pleased herself, she tried with all her might to please everybody, and we know that she was eminent and successful as a practitioner in the art of giving pleasure. As for Joe's, even in that little interview in the garret at the Elephant Inn, she had found means to win back a great deal of his goodwill. In the course of a week, the civilian was her sworn slave and frantic admirer. He didn't go to sleep after dinner, as was his custom, in the much less lively society of Amelia. He drove out with Becky in his open carriage. He asked little parties and invented festivities to do her honor. Tapeworm, the secretary of legation, who had abused her so cruelly, came to dine with Joe's and then came every day to pay his respects to Becky. Poor Emmy, who was never very talkative and more glum and silent than ever after Dobbin's departure, was quite forgotten when this superior genius made her appearance. The French minister was as much charmed with her as his English rival. The German ladies, never particularly squeamish as regard morals, especially in English people, were delighted with the cleverness and wit of Mrs. Osborne's charming friend. And though she did not ask to go to court, yet the most august and transparent personages there heard of her fascinations and were quite curious to know her. When it became known that she was noble of an ancient English family, that her husband was a colonel of the guard, excellence and governor of an island, only separated from his lady by one of those trifling differences, which are of little account in a country where Werther is still read, and Wolvenschaften of Goethe is considered an edifying moral book. Nobody thought of refusing to receive her in the very highest society of the little duché, and the ladies were even more ready to call her due and swear eternal friendship for her than they had been to bestow the same inestimable benefits upon Amelia. Love and liberty are interpreted by those simple Germans in a way which honest folks in Yorkshire 
and Somersetshire little understand. And a lady might, in some philosophic and civilized towns, be divorced ever so many times from her respective husbands and keep her character in society. Joe's house never was so pleasant since he had a house of his own as Rebecca caused it to be. She sang, she played, she laughed, she talked in two or three languages. She brought everybody to the house, and she made Joe's believe that it was his own great social talents and wit which gathered the great society of the place round about him. As for Emmy, who found herself not in the least mistress of her own house, except when the bills were to be paid. Becky soon discovered the way to soothe and please her. She talked to her perpetually about Major Dobbin, sent about his business, and made no scruple of declaring her admiration for that excellent, high-minded gentleman, and of telling Emmy that she had behaved most cruelly regarding him. Emmy defended her conduct and showed that it was dictated only by the purest religious principles, that a woman wants, etc., and to such an angel as him whom she had had the good fortune to marry, was married forever. But she had no objection to hear the major praised, as much as Becky chose to praise him, and indeed brought the conversation round to the Dobbin subject a score of times every day. Means were easily found to win the favor of Georgie and the servants. Amelia's maid, it has been said, was heart and soul in favor of the generous major. Having at first disliked Becky, for being the means of dismissing him from the presence of her mistress, she was reconciled to Mrs. Crawley subsequently, because the latter became William's most ardent admirer and champion and in those mighty conclaves in which the two ladies indulged after their parties, and while Miss Payne was brushing their airs, as she liked to call the yellow locks of the one and the soft brown tresses of the other, this girl always put in her word for that dear, good gentleman, Major Dobbin. Her advocacy did not make Amelia angry any more than Rebecca's admiration of him, she made George write to him constantly and persisted in sending Mama's kind love and postscript. And as she looked at her husband's portrait of knights, it no longer reproached her. Perhaps she reproached it. Now William was gone. Emmy was not very happy after her heroic sacrifice. She was very distraught, nervous, silent, and ill to please. The family had never known her so peevish. She grew pale and ill. She used to try and sing certain songs. Einsem bein ich nicht allein was one of them. That tender love song of Weber's, which, in old-fashioned days, young ladies, and when you were scarcely born, showed that those who lived before you knew, too, how to love and to sing. Certain songs, I say, to which the major was partial. And she warbled them in the twilight in the drawing room. She would break off in the midst of the song and walking into her neighboring apartment and there, no doubt, take refuge in the miniature of her husband. Some books still subsisted after Dobbin's departure, and his name was written in them. A German dictionary, for instance, with William Dobbin, Reg, in the flyleaf. A guidebook with his initials, and one or two other volumes which belonged to the major. Emmy cleared these away and put them on the drawers, where she had packed her workbox, her desk, her Bible, and a prayer book under the pictures of the two Georges, and the major on going away. 
left his gloves behind. It is a fact that Georgie, rummaging his mother's desk some time afterwards, found the gloves neatly folded up and put them in what they call the secret drawers of the desk. Not caring for society and moping there a great deal, Emmy's chief pleasure in the summer evenings was to take long walks with Georgie, during which Rebecca was left to the society of Mr. Joseph. And then the mother and son used to talk about the major in a way which even made the boy smile. She told him that she thought Major William was the best man in all the world, the gentlest and the kindest, the bravest and the humblest. Over and over again, she told him how they owed everything which they possessed in the world to that kind friend's benevolent care of them, how he had befriended them all through their poverty and misfortunes, watched over them when nobody cared for them, how all his comrades admired him, though he never spoke of his own gallant actions, how Georgie's father trusted him beyond all other men and had been constantly befriended by the good William. Why, when your papa was a little boy, she said, he often told me that it was William who defended him against a tyrant at the school where they were and their friendship never ceased from that day until the last, when your dear father fell. Did Dobbin kill the man who killed Papa? Georgie asked. I'm sure he did, or he would have if he could have caught him, wouldn't he, Mother? When I'm in the army, won't I hate the French? That's all. In such colloquies, the mother and child passed a great deal of their time together. The artless woman had made a confidant of the boy. He was as much William's friend as everybody else who knew him well. By the way, Mrs. Becky, not to be behindhand in sentiment, had got a miniature, too, hanging up in her room, to the surprise and amusement of most people, and the delight of the original, who was no other than our friend Joe's. On her first coming to favor the Sedleys with a visit, the little woman, who had arrived with a remarkably small, shabby kit, was perhaps ashamed of the meanness of her trunks and bandboxes, and often spoke with great respect about her baggage left behind at Leipzig, which she must have from that city. When a traveler talks to you perpetually about the splendor of his luggage, which he does not happen to have with him, my son. Beware of that traveler. He is, ten to one, an impostor. Neither Joe's nor Emmy knew this important maxim. It seemed to them of no consequence whether Becky had a quantity of very fine clothes in invisible trunks, but as her present supply was exceedingly shabby, Emmy supplied her out of her own stores, or took her to the best milliner in the town, and there fitted her out. It was no more torn collars now, I promise you, and faded silks trailing off at the shoulder. Becky changed her habits with her situation in life. The rouge pot was suspended. Another excitement to which she had accustomed herself was also put aside, or at least only indulged in, in privacy. And when she was prevailed on by Joe's of a summer evening, Emmy and the boy being absent on their walks, to take a little spirit and water. But if she did not indulge, the courier did. That rascal Kirsch could not be kept from the bottle, nor could he tell how much he took when he applied to it. He was sometimes surprised himself at the way in which Mr. Sedley's cognac diminished. Well, well, this is a painful subject. Becky did not very likely indulge so much as she used before she encountered a decorous family. At last, the much-bragged-about boxes arrived from Leipzig, three of them, 
not by any means large or splendid. Nor did Becky appear to take out any sort of dresses or ornaments from the boxes when they did arrive. But out of one, which contained a mass of her papers, it was the very box which Rodden Crawley had ransacked in his furious hunt for Becky's concealed money. She took a picture with great glee, which she pinned up in her room, and to which she introduced Joe's. It was the portrait of a gentleman in pencil, his face having the advantage of being painted up in pink. He was riding on an elephant away from some cocoa nut trees and a pagoda. It was an eastern scene. "'God bless my soul! It is my portrait!' Joes cried out. It was he indeed, blooming in youth and beauty, in a nankeen jacket of the cut of 1804. It was the old picture that used to hang up in Russell Square. "'I bought it,' said Becky, in a voice trembling with emotion. "'I went to see if I could be of any use to my kind friends. "'I have never parted with that picture. I never will.' "'Won't you?' Joes cried with a look of unutterable rapture and satisfaction. "'Do you really now value it for my sake?' "'You know I did well enough,' said Becky. "'But why speak? Well, I think. Why look back? It's too late now.' The evening's conversation was delicious for Joes. Emmy only came in to go to bed very tired and unwell. Joe's and his fair guest had a charming tete-a-tete, -tete, and his sister could hear, as she lay awake in her adjoining chamber, Rebecca singing over to Joe's the old songs of 1815. He did not sleep for a wonder that night, any more than Amelia. It was June, and by consequence, high season in London. Joes, who read the incomparable Galignani, the exile's best friend, through every day, used to favor the ladies with extracts from his paper during their breakfast. Every week in this paper there is a full account of military movements in which Joes, as a man who had seen service, was especially interested. On one occasion he read out, Arrival of the Regiment Gravesend, June 20 The Ramchunder, East India man, came into the river this morning, having on board 14 officers and 132 rank and file of this gallant corps. They have been absent from England 14 years, having been embarked the year after Waterloo in which glorious conflict they took an active part, and having subsequently distinguished themselves in the Burmese War. The veteran colonel, Sir Michael O'Dowd, K.C.B., with his lady and sister, landed here yesterday with Captains Posky, Stubble, McCraw, Maloney, Lieutenant Smith, Jones, Thompson, F. Thompson, Enzines, Hicks, and Grady, the band on the pier playing the national anthem, and the crowd loudly cheering the gallant veterans as they went into Waite's Hotel, where a sumptuous banquet was provided for the defenders of old England. During the repast, which we need not say was served up in Waite's best style, the cheering continued so enthusiastically that Lady O'Dowd and the colonel came forward to the balcony and drank the healths of their fellow countrymen in a bumper of Waite's best claret. On the second occasion, Jos read a brief announcement. Major Dobbin had joined the regiment at Chatham, and subsequently he promulgated accounts of the presentations at the drawing-room of Colony Sir Michael O'Dowd, K. C. B., Lady O'Dowd, by Miss Molly Maloney, of Ballymaloney, and Miss 
Glorvina O'Dowd by Lady O'Dowd. Almost directly after this, Dobbin's name appeared among the lieutenant colonels, for Old Marshal Tipoff had died during the passage of the from Madras, and the sovereign was pleased to advance Colonel Sir Michael O'Dowd to the rank of Major General on his return to England, with an intimation that he should be Colonel of the distinguished regiment which he had so long commanded. Amelia had been made aware of some of these movements. The correspondence between George and his guardian had not ceased by any means. William had even written once or twice to her since his departure, but in a manner so unconstrainedly cold that the poor woman felt now in her turn that she had lost her power over him, and that, as he had said, he was free. He had left her, and she was wretched. The memory of his almost countless services and lofty and affectionate regard now presented itself to her and rebuked her day and night. She brooded over those recollections according to her want, saw the purity and beauty of the affection with which she had trifled and reproached herself for having flung away such a treasure. It was gone indeed. William had spent it all out. He loved her no more, he thought, as he had loved her. He could never again. That sort of regard which he had proffered to her for so many faithful years can't be flung down and shattered and mended so as to show no scars. The little heedless tyrant had so destroyed it. No, William thought again and again. It was myself I deluded and persisted in cajoling had she been worthy of the love I gave her. She would have returned it long ago. It was a fond mistake. Isn't the whole course of life made up of such? And suppose I had won her. Should I not have been disenchanted the day after my victory? Why pine or be ashamed of my defeat? The more he thought of this long passage of his life, the more clearly he saw his deception. I'll go into harness again, he said, and do my duty in that state of life in which it has pleased heaven to place me. I will see that the buttons of the recruits are properly bright, and that the sergeants make no mistakes in their accounts. I will dine at mess and listen to the Scotch surgeon telling his stories. When I am old and broke, I will go on half pay, and my old sisters shall scold me. I have galip unglept, as the girl in Wallenstein says. I am done. Pay the bills and get me a cigar. Find out what there is at the play tonight, Francis. Tomorrow we cross by the Bativiere. He made the above speech, whereof of Francis only heard the last two lines, pacing up and down at the Bumpjes at Rotterdam. The Bataviere was lying in the basin. He could see the place on the quarter deck, where he and Emmy had sat on the happy voyage out. What had that little Miss Crawley to say to him? Sha, tomorrow we will put to sea and return to England, home and duty. After June, all the little court society of Pumpernickel used to separate, according to the German plan, and make for a hundred watering places where they drank at the wells, rode upon donkeys, gambled at the redoubts, if they had any money and a mind, rushed with hundreds of their kind to Gourmandise at the Tables de Haute, and idled away the summer. The English diplomats went off to Toplitz and Kissingen, their French rivals shut up their chancellerie and whisked away to their darling Boulevard de Gand. 
the transparent reigning family took, too, to the waters, or retired to their hunting lodges. Everybody went away having any pretensions to politeness, and, of course, with them, Dr. von Glauber, the court doctor and his baroness. The seasons for the baths were the most productive periods of the doctor's practice. He united business with pleasure, and his chief place of resort was Ostend, which is much frequented by Germans, and where the doctor treated himself and his spouse to what he called a dib in the sea. His interesting patient, Joe's, was a regular milch cow to the doctor, and he easily persuaded the civilian, both for his own health's sake and that of his charming sister, which was really very much shattered, to pass the summer at that hideous seaport town. Emmy did not care where she went much. Georgie jumped at the idea of a move. As for Becky, she came as a matter of course in the fourth place, inside of the fine barouche Mr. Joes had bought, the two domestics being on the box in front. She might have some misgivings about the friends whom she should meet at Ostend, and who might be likely to tell ugly stories. But, bah, she was strong enough to hold her own. She had cast such an anchor in Joe's now as would require a strong storm to shake. That incident of the picture had finished him. Becky took down her elephant and put it into the little box which she had had from Amelia ever so many years ago. Emmy also came off with her Loris, her two pictures, and the party, finally, were lodged in an exceedingly dear and uncomfortable house at Austin. There Amelia began to take baths and get what good she could from them, and though scores of people of Becky's acquaintance passed her and cut her, yet Mrs. Osborne, who walked about with her, and who knew nobody, was not aware of the treatment experienced by the friend whom she had chosen so judiciously as a companion. Indeed, Becky never thought fit to tell her what was passing under her innocent eyes. Some of Mrs. Rodden Crawley's acquaintances, however, acknowledged her readily enough, perhaps more readily than she would have desired. Among those were Major Loader, unattached, and Captain Rook, late of the rifles, who might be seen any day on the dyke smoking and staring at the women, and who speedily got an introduction to the hospitable board and select circle of Mr. Joseph Sedley. In fact, they would take no denial. They burst into the house whether Becky was at home or not, walked into Mrs. Osborne's drawing-room, which they perfumed with their coats and mustachios, called Joe's old buck, and invaded his dinner-table, and laughed and drank for long hours there. "'What can they mean?' asked Georgie, who did not like these gentlemen. "'I heard the Major say to Mrs. Crawley yesterday, "'No, no, Becky, you shan't keep that old buck to yourself.' We must have the bones in, or dammy, I'll split. What could the major mean, Mama? Major? Don't call him major, Emmy said. I'm sure I can't tell what he meant. His presence and that of his friend inspired the little lady with intolerable terror and aversion. They paid her tipsy compliments. They leered at her over the dinner table and the captain made advances that filled her with a sickening dismay, nor would she ever see him unless she had George by her side. Rebecca also, to do her justice, never would let either of these men remain alone with Amelia. The major was disengaged, too, and swore he would be the winner of her. 
A couple of ruffians were fighting for this innocent creature, gambling for her at her own table, and though she was not aware of the rascal's designs upon her, yet she felt a horror and uneasiness in their presence and longed to fly. She besought, she entreated Joes to come home. Not he. He was slow of movement, tied to his doctor, and perhaps to some other leading strings. At least Becky was not anxious to go to England. At last she took a great resolution, made the great plunge. She wrote off a letter to a friend whom she had on the other side of the water, a letter about which she did not speak a word to anyone, which she carried herself to the post under her shawl. Nor was any remark made about it, only that she looked very much flushed and agitated when Georgie met her, and she kissed him and hung over him a great deal that night. She did not come out of her room after her return from her walk. Becky thought it was Major Loder and the captain who frightened her. She mustn't stop here, Becky reasoned with herself. She must go away, that silly little fool. She is still whimpering after that gaby of a husband, dead and served right, those fifteen years. She shan't marry either of these men. It's too bad of Loder. Now she shall marry the bamboo cane. I'll settle it this very night. So Becky took a cup of tea to Amelia in her private apartment, and found the lady in the company of her miniatures, and in a most melancholy and nervous condition. She laid down the cup of tea. Thank you, said Amelia. Listen to me, Amelia, said Becky, marching up and down the room before the other and surveying her with a sort of contemptuous kindness. I want to talk to you. You must go away from here and from the impertinences of these men. I won't have you harassed by them, and they will insult you if you stay. I tell you they are rascals, men fit to be sent to the hulks. Never mind how I know them. I know everybody. Joes can't protect you. He is too fat and weak and wants a protector himself. You are no more fit to live in the world than a baby in arms. You must marry or you and your precious boy will go to ruin. You must have a husband, you fool, and one of the best gentlemen I ever saw has offered you a hundred times and you have rejected him, you silly, heartless, ungrateful little creature. I tried, I tried my best, indeed I did, Rebecca, said Amelia deprecatingly, but I couldn't forget, and she finished the sentence by looking up at the portrait. "'Couldn't forget him?' cried out Becky. "'That selfish humbug, that low-bred cockney dandy, "'that padded booby who had neither wit nor manners nor heart "'and was no more to be compared to your friend with the bamboo cane "'than you are to Queen Elizabeth. "'Why, the man was weary of you.' and would have jilted you, but that Dobbin forced him to keep his word. He owned it to me. He never cared for you. He used to sneer about you to me time after time, and made love to me the week after he married you. It's false! It's false, Rebecca! cried out Amelia, starting up. Look there, you fool! Becky said, still with provoking good humor. And taking a little paper out of her belt, she opened it and flung it into Emmy's lap. You know his handwriting. He wrote that to me, wanted me to run away with him, gave it to me under your nose the day before he was shot, and served him right, Becky repeated. Emmy did not hear her. She was looking at the letter. It was that which George had put into the bouquet and given to Becky on the night of the Duke of Richmond's ball. 
It was as she said. The foolish young man had asked her to fly. Emmy's head sank down for almost the last time in which she shall be called upon to weep in this history. She commenced that work. Her head fell to her bosom, and her hands went up to her eyes. And there for a while she gave way to her emotions, as Becky stood on and regarded her. Who shall analyze those tears, and say whether they were sweet or bitter? Was she most grieved because the idol of her life was tumbled down and shivered at her feet? or indignant that her love had been so despised, or glad because the barrier was removed which modestly had placed between her and a new real affection. There is nothing to forbid me now, she thought. I may love him with all my heart now. Oh, I will, I will, if he will but let me and forgive me. I believe it was this feeling rushed over all the others which agitated that gentle little bosom. Indeed, she did not cry so much as Becky expected. The other soothed and kissed her, a rare mark of sympathy with Mrs. Becky. She treated Emmy like a child and patted her head. And now let us get pen and ink and write to him to come this minute, she said. Uh, I wrote to him this morning, Emmy said, blushing exceedingly. Becky screamed with laughter. Un bigliato, she sang out with Rosina. E colo qua. The whole house echoed with her shrill singing. Two mornings after this little scene, although the day was rainy and gusty, and Amelia had had an exceedingly wakeful night, listening to the wind roaring, and pitying all travelers by land and by water. Yet she got up early, and insisted upon taking a walk on the dike with Georgie, and there she paced as the rain beat into her face, and she looked out westward across the dark sea line, and over the swollen billows, which came tumbling and frothing to the shore. Neither spoke much except now and then, when the boy said a few words to his timid companion, indicative of sympathy and protection. "'I hope he won't cross in such weather,' Emmy said. "'I bet ten to one he does,' the boy answered. "'Look, mother, there's smoke of the steamer.' It was that signal, sure enough. But though the steamer was under way, he might not be on board." He might not have got the letter. He might not choose to come. A hundred fears poured over the other into the little heart, as fast as the waves onto the dike. The boat followed the smoke into sight. Georgie had a dandy telescope and got the vessel under view in the most skillful manner, and he made appropriate nautical comments upon the manner of the approach of the steamer as she came nearer and nearer, dipping and rising in the water. The signal of an English steamer in sight went fluttering up to the mast of the pier. I dare say Mrs. Amelia's heart was in a similar flutter. Emmy tried to look through the telescope over George's shoulder, but she could make nothing of it. She only saw a black eclipse bobbing up and down before her eyes. George took the glass again and raked the vessel. How she does pitch, he said. There goes a wave slap over her bows. There's only two people on deck besides the steermen. There's a man lying down, a chap in a cloak, and a hooray, it's Dob by Jingo. He clapped to the telescope and flung his arms round his mother. As for that lady, let us say what she did in the words of a favorite poet. She was sure it was William. It could be no other. What she had said about hoping that he would not come was all hypocrisy. Of course he would come. 
What could he do else but come? She knew he would come. The ship came swiftly nearer and nearer. As they went in to meet her at the landing place at the quay, Emmy's knees trembled so that she scarcely could run. She would have liked to kneel down and say her prayers of thanks there. Oh, she thought, she would be all her life saying them. It was such a bad day that as the vessel came alongside of the quay, there were no idlers abroad, scarcely even a commissioner on the lookout for the few passengers in the steamer. That young scapegrace George had fled too. And as the gentleman in the old cloak, lined with red stuff, stepped on to the shore, there was scarcely anyone present to see what took place, which was briefly this. A lady in a dripping white bonnet and shawl, with her two little hands out before her, went up to him, and in the next minute she had altogether disappeared under the folds of the old cloak, and was kissing one of his hands with all her might, whilst the other, I suppose, was engaged in holding her to his heart, which her head just about reached, and in preventing her from tumbling down. She was murmuring something about, forgive, dear William, dear, dear, dearest friend, and kiss, 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 and so forth, and in fact went on under the cloak in an absurd manner. When Emmy emerged from it, she still kept tight hold of one of William's hands and looked up in his face. It was full of sadness and tender love and pity. She understood its reproach and hung down her head. It was time you sent for me, dear Amelia, he said. You will never go again, William. No, never, he answered, and pressed the dear little soul once more to his heart. As they issued out of the custom house precincts, Georgie broke out upon them, with his telescope up to his eye, and a loud laugh of welcome. He danced around the couple, and performed many facetious antics as he led them up to the house. Joe's wasn't up yet, Becky not visible, though she looked at them through the blinds. Georgie ran off to see about breakfast. Emmy, whose shawl and bonnet were off in the passage in the hands of Miss Payne, now went to undo the clasp of William's cloak. And we will, if you please, go with George and look after breakfast for the Colonel. The vessel is in port. He has got the prize he has been trying for all his life. The bird has come in at last. There it is with its head on his shoulder, billing and cooing close up to his heart, with soft, outstretched, fluttering wings. This is what he has asked for every day and hour for eighteen years. This is what he pined after. Here it is, the summit, the end. The last page of the third volume. Goodbye, Colonel. God bless you, honest William. Farewell, dear Amelia. Grow green again, tender little parasite, round the rugged old oak to which you cling. Perhaps it was compunction towards the kind and simple creature who had been the first in life to defend her. Perhaps it was a dislike to all such sentimental scenes. But Rebecca, satisfied with her part in the transaction, never presented herself before Colonel Dobbin and the lady whom he married. Particular business, she said, took her to Bruges, whither she went. And only Georgie and his uncle were present at the marriage ceremony. When it was over and Georgie had rejoined his parents, Mrs. Becky returned, just for a few days, to comfort the solitary bachelor, Joseph Sedley. He preferred a continental life, he said, 
and declined to join in housekeeping with his sister and her husband. Emmy was glad in her heart to think that she had written to her husband before she read or knew of that letter of George's. I knew it all along, William said. But could I use that weapon against the poor fellow's memory? It was that which made me suffer so when you never speak of that day again, Emmy cried out, so contrite and humble that William turned off the conversation by his account of Glorvina and dear old Peggy O'Dowd, with whom he was sitting when the letter of recall reached him. If you hadn't sent for me, he added with a laugh, who knows what Glorvina's name might be now. At present, it is Glorvina Posky, now Mrs. Major Posky. She took him on the death of his first wife, having resolved never to marry out of the regiment. Lady O'Dowd is also so attached to it that she says, if anything were to happen to Mick, be dad, she'd come back and marry some of them. But the Major General is quite well and lives in great splendor in O'Dowd's town with a pack of beagles and, with the exception of perhaps their neighbor, Hogarty of Castle Hogarty, he is the first man of his county. Her ladyship still dances jigs and insisted on standing up to the master of the horse at the Lord Lieutenant's last ball. Both she and Glorvina declared that Dobbin had used the latter shamefully. But Posky falling in, Glorvina was consoled, and a beautiful turban from Paris appeased the wrath of Lady O'Dowd. When Colonel Dobbin quit the service, which he did immediately after his marriage, he rented a pretty little country place in Hampshire, not far from Queen's Crawley, where, after the passing of the Reform Bill, Sir Pitt and his family constantly resided now. All idea of a peerage was out of the question, the baronet's two seats in Parliament being lost. He was both out of pocket and out of spirits by that catastrophe, failed in his health, and prophesied the speedy ruin of the empire. Lady Jane and Mrs. Dobbin became great friends, there was a perpetual crossing of the pony chases between the hall and the evergreens, the colonel's place, rented of his friend Major Ponto, who was abroad with his family. Her ladyship was godmother to Mrs. Dobbin's child, which bore her name and was Christian by the Reverend James Crawley, who succeeded his father in the living and a pretty close friendship subsisted between the two lads, George and Rodden, who hunted and shot together in the vacations, were both entered of the same college at Cambridge, and quarreled with each other about Lady Jane's daughter, with whom they were both, of course, in love. A match between George and that young lady was long a favorite scheme of both the matrons, though I have heard that Miss Crawley herself inclined toward her cousin. Mrs. Rodden Crawley's name was never mentioned by either family. There were reasons why all should be silent regarding her. For wherever Mr. Joseph Sedley went, she traveled likewise, and that infatuated man seemed to be entirely her slave. The colonel's lawyers informed him that his brother-in-law had effected a heavy insurance upon his life, whence it was probable that he had been raising money to discharge debts. He procured prolonged leave of absence from the East India House, and indeed his infirmities were daily increasing. On hearing the news about the insurance, Amelia, in a good deal of alarm, entreated her husband to go to Brussels, where Joe's then was, and inquire into the state of his affairs. 
the colonel quit home with reluctance, for he was deeply immersed in his history of the Punjab, which still occupies him, and much alarmed about his little daughter, whom he idolizes, and who was just recovering from the chickenpox, and went to Brussels and found Joe's living in one of those enormous hotels in that city. Mrs. Crawley, who had her carriage, gave entertainments, and lived in a very genteel manner, occupied another suite of apartments in the same hotel. The colonel, of course, did not desire to see that lady, or even think proper to notify his arrival at Brussels, except privately to Joe's, by a message through his valet. Joe's begged the colonel to come and see him that night, when Mrs. Crawley would be at a soiree, and when they could meet alone. He found his brother-in-law in a condition of pitiable infirmity, and dreadfully afraid of Rebecca, though eager in his praises of her. She tended him through a series of unheard-of illnesses, with a fidelity most admirable. She had been a daughter to him, but but, oh, for God's sake, do come and live near me and, and see me sometimes, whimpered out the unfortunate man. The colonel's brow darkened at this. We can't, Joes, he said. Considering the circumstances, Amelia can't visit you. I swear to you, I swear to you on the Bible, gasped out Joseph, wanting to kiss the book that she is as innocent as a child, as spotless as your own wife. It may be so, said the colonel gloomily, but Emmy can't come to you. Be a man, Joes. Break off this disreputable connection. Come home to your family. We hear your affairs are involved. Involved, cried Joes. Who has told such calumnies? All my money is placed out most advantageously. Mrs. Crawley, that is, I mean, it is laid out to the best interest. You are not in debt, then? Why did you insure your life? I thought a little present to her in case anything happened. And you know my health is so delicate common gratitude, you know, and I intend to leave all my money to you. And I can spare it out of my income. I indeed, I can, cried out William's weak brother-in-law. The colonel besought Joes to fly at once, to go back to India, whither Miss Crawley could not follow him, to do anything to break off a connection which might have the most fatal consequences to him. Joe's clasped his hands and cried. He would go back to India. He would do anything, only he must have time. Th they mustn't say anything to Mrs. Crawley. She'd, she'd kill me if she knew. You don't know what a terrible woman she is, the poor wretch said. Then why not come away with me, said Dobbin in reply. But Joe's had not the courage. He would see Dobbin again in the morning. He must on no account say that he had been there. He must go now. Becky might come in. And Dobbin quit him, full of forebodings. He never saw Joe's more. Three months afterwards, Joseph Sedley died at Excel Chapelle. It was found that all his property had been muddled away in speculations and was represented by valueless shares in different bubble companies. All his available assets were the two thousand pounds for which his life was insured, and which were left equally between his beloved sister Amelia, wife of etc., and his friend and invaluable attendant during sickness, Rebecca, the wife of Lieutenant Colonel Rodden Crawley, C.B., who was appointed administratrix. 
The solicitor of the insurance company swore it was the blackest case that ever had come before him, talked of sending a commission to X to examine into the death, and the company refused payment of the policy. But Mrs. or Lady Crawley, as she styled herself, came to town at once, attended with her solicitors, Mr. Burke, Thurtell, and Hayes, of Thaves Inn, and dared the company to refuse the payment, invited examination, declared she was the object of an infamous conspiracy, which had been pursuing her all through life, and triumphed finally. The money was paid, and her character established, but Colonel Dobbin sent back his share of the legacy to the insurance office and rigidly declined to hold any communication with Rebecca. She never was Lady Crowley, though she continued so to call herself. His Excellency, Colonel Rodden Crowley, died of yellow fever at Coventry Island, most deeply beloved and deplored, and six weeks before the demise of his brother, Sir Pitt, the estate, consequently, devolved upon the present Sir Raleigh Crawley, Bart. He, too, has declined to see his mother, to whom he makes a liberal allowance, and who, besides, appears to be very wealthy. The baronet lives entirely at Queen's Crawley, with Lady Jane and her daughter, whilst Rebecca, Lady Crawley, chiefly hangs out about Bath and Cheltenham, where a very strong party of excellent people consider her to be a most injured woman. She has her enemies. Who has not? Her life is her answer to them. She busies herself in works of piety. She goes to church and never without a footman. Her name is in all the charity lists the destitute orange girl, the neglected washerwoman, the distressed muffin man, find in her a fast and generous friend. She is always having stalls at fancy fairs for the benefit of those hapless beings. Emmy, her children, and the colonel, coming to London some time back, found themselves suddenly before her at one of these fairs, she cast down her eyes demurely and smiled as they started away from her, Emmy scurrying off on the arm of George, now grown a dashing young gentleman, and the colonel seizing up his little Janey, of whom he is fonder than of anything in the world, fonder even than of his history of the Punjab. Fonder than he is of me, Emmy thinks with a sigh but he never said a word to Amelia that was not kind and gentle or thought of a want of hers that he did not try to gratify. Ah, vanitus, vanitatum, which of us is happy in this world? Which of us has his desire or having it is satisfied? Come, children, let us shut up the box and the puppets, for our play is played out. The End of Vanity Fair